All right, so C++. So one of the biggest differences when you, when you start using C or C++ um, coming from languages like Python or Java is how memory is handled, okay? Because as we talked about last time, C++ is not a garbage collected language, which means that you can't just allocate memory all over the place and not care about it, okay? So Java and Python have garbage collection where you can allocate memory and it sorts of, it figures out whether or not you still have access to that memory and based on it thinking you still have access or not, it will deallocate that memory for you. C++ and C are not like that at all. However, by the end of this lecture, we will see that even though C++ is not a garbage collected language, we can get away with really not having to worry too much about memory management. So there's two types, uh, like abstract types of memory in, in terms of how we allocate it in C++. There's stack memory and heap memory. So when a program is launched that's written in C++, the operating system gives it uh, a number of areas of memory that it can operate with. So the main two that we can manipulate are the stack memory and the heap memory. And there's a bunch of differences between them, which we'll get into. So both the stack and the heap are stored in RAM. And the difference is determined by the operating system when the program runs, okay? So the operating system will say this part of the memory is available for the stack and this part available is available for the heap. So the stack and the heap memory at a basic level, they just store data, okay? So data is stored in the stack and data is stored in the heap. We are going to request an amount of memory either from the stack or from the heap and the program will give it to us, okay? The main differences between stack memory and heap memory are the size of memory available. So there's a lot less memory available for the stack than it is than there are for the heap. And if you've ever been to the website Stack Overflow, the reason for the name Stack Overflow is because if you're doing a recursion or something in C++ and you run out of stack memory um, due to like an infinite loop or trying to allocate too much on the stack, what you get is a stack overflow and your program will clash. So that's your program will crash and that's why they named the, uh, the website that. The way memory is found and allocated is different. The speed of the memory allocation is different. The way we request memory in our code is different. And also stack memory is deallocated when it leaves scope, okay? So it gets popped off the stack. So we're gonna go through uh, a number of examples and hopefully it will be really, really clear to you by the end of, you know, 20 minutes or so from now what the difference between stack and heap memory are. We're not going to go into the real specifics. For example, the program code lives on the stack, but we don't need to go that deep into like separating the stack between like where the variables are allocated and where the code is living. It's not like a hacking or security course where we really need to know that. So we'll be going into practical examples that we'll be using in the course rather than like completely destructing the stack in the heap and, and wondering and, and really going down to a super, super deep level. So let's say we have our function. So we have a main function here. If we declare int val equals five, so that's just a plain primitive type integer in C++ and we've given it a value of five. So whenever we allocate um, a primitive type or a class or a struct by default like this with no extra symbols, that memory is going on the stack, okay? Whenever we allocate memory with the new keyword, okay, so for example, and we'll get into pointers a little bit later, but if I have a pointer to an integer called hval, which is heap value, and I say equals new int, so that will allocate the memory. It goes and asks the operating system, hey, give me some memory on the heap because I've used the new keyword. In C, you don't have the new keyword, so you, you'd use, you'd, you would use malloc, but we're not getting that low level in this course. And then in order to set the value of this, and we'll get into pointers, we can say, okay, we've allocated the memory for it and now set a value of five. So this value where this data is pointing to lives on the heap and here this memory for this val lives on the stack. So that's one of the differences. So that's how you would allocate memory on the stack versus allocating it on the heap. Same thing goes with arrays, okay? 
So if I have a static array in C or C++, so I say this, this is the uh, syntax that I would use for that. So I'm going to have int a for my array, and that's going to have five entries. So all five entries, and an integer is four bytes, so all 20 bytes of that array lives on the stack. Versus if I want a heap allocated or a dynamically sized array in C++, I would say int star heap array equals new int five, okay? Then I can refer to HA or heap array with an index like a normal array. But wherever I allocate memory using the new keyword, then that is memory that's allocated on the heap, all right? Again, uh, if I had a custom class that I declared, then I can do the same thing with that. So if I have my class C, then I pass in some args. If I allocate it in this way by saying my class, variable name, and then the arguments in brackets, then that entire class is allocated on the stack. Um, or I can heap allocate my, um, my class as well. So I can say my class pointer HC equals new my class with the same args. And then that, that instantiation of that object will actually live on the heap, okay, instead of on the stack. So that's just an example of how we would call, I want the memory to live here on the stack versus I want memory to live on the heap. So stack memory, what is stack memory? It has a predefined size and typically it's just a few megabytes. So there's really not a lot of memory available on the stack. It's used mostly for the program code and local variable allocation, okay? So again, any variables that we allocate on the stack will be automatically destructed when they leave scope, okay? So this my class C, when we get down to, oh, I don't have my pointer. So this my class C, as soon as we get down to this right here, when the scope leaves, the destructor for C will automatically be called. That is not the case for the heap allocated pointer to a my class. And we'll see examples of that in the future. So um, it's very easy to run out of stack memory. And so if you have large data structures, like if you have say uh, an array that's going to have multiple megabytes of data stored into it, you, you cannot allocate that on the stack, okay? We would want to have a heap allocation for that large array. Local variables, that are allocated without the new keyword are allocated on the stack by default, okay? So if we do not specify the new keyword, then um, these variables are allocated with their memory on the stack. Now, if in the constructor for that class, we have heap allocated memory, right, which we can do, then of course that stuff will be on the heap but the actual variables that are living in that uh, class will be on the stack. Program function calls and return addresses are also allocated on the stack, but we will not be, um, we will not be going greatly into detail of that, okay? So uh, I'm gonna show some examples of this now of how stack memory works, and I'm going to use the, the visual aid of an actual stack. Okay, so hopefully this is a fourth year course, you've all seen a stack. So stack, uh, can people in the chat, um, how does data go into and out of a stack? Can anyone in the chat answer that for me? People in the class, hopefully. Ah, Taswaf, got it wrong. So yes. So it is not first in, first out. First in, first out is a queue, right? Think of an actual stack of objects. Let me see if I have some objects here. What kind of objects do I have? I have a phone, I have this, okay. So here's what a stack is, right? I have my phone, I'm going to stack things on top of it. Here's my driver's registration because I just renewed my driver's license online. Here is a uh, needle nose pliers because I just had to get a light bulb out that broke, okay? So here's a stack of things. If I pop something off the stack, it's not the first thing that I added that gets removed. It's the last thing that I added that gets removed, right? So you've all seen examples of that. That's the stack, okay? So that's stack memory. So we're gonna go 
line by line through an example. And this is not literally exactly how it works, but it's a good enough abstraction that you'll know how stack memory works. Okay, so we've got our int main here, and somewhere on the stack is the current address of stack memory. Okay, so the operating system system sets that up, sets that up for us. We have no variables allocated on the stack before we run the program. So now we say int i equals six. So what happens is that variable i gets allocated on the stack, okay? And so the stack memory holds the value of six, and whenever we refer to the variable i in our code, the code looks up this value and gets the six and returns it, okay? Then what we can do is we're gonna say int b equals 10. And so on top of the six on the stack is the variable 10, okay? Makes sense. Next, we've got some custom data structure, which is a point, and we're going to allocate that on the stack. So let's say a point consists of, an int of two integers, an x and a y value. Well, when this gets allocated, the 5 is going to go on first, and the 4 is going to go on next, okay? It actually keeps like a little bit more information about that, hey, this is this type of class, etc. But essentially, this data goes onto the stack in that order, all right? Now, if we're done, and then we exit this block of code, it doesn't have to be a function, just any block of code, then when I get to this uh, bracket here, things get popped off the stack in reverse order of their allocation, right? First in, last out. So, or last in, first out, if you wanna say it that way. So the last thing that was put on the stack was the point. So that gets popped off the stack. The next last thing was the variable b, so that gets popped off the stack. And then the next thing was the six, and that gets popped off the stack, okay? So when we're talking about just pure data stack allocated variables, no heap memory whatsoever, we don't need to worry about memory allocation in C++ because things that get allocated on the stack get popped off the stack, okay? Now the one extra thing here is that when you pop a class, a heap allocated class off the stack, its destructor also gets called, okay? And we'll talk about why that is important when we get a bit later in the lecture. So all these things get popped off, and when the program terminates, all our memory has been freed, and all is good to go. Okie doke. So, the stack memory is also known as static memory, and the reason it's called static memory is because all static memory allocation sizes need to be known at compile time. Okay, so because the stack operates in a very specific way and your program code is there as well, your program has to know how much, um, how much memory is to be allocated on the stack at compile time. Okay, so that's a very important issue. So memory allocations which depend on runtime variables, we call those dynamic memory sizes, must be heap allocated. Okay, so for example, if we want to do something like have a bunch of students, like we did last time, we had a bunch of students in a file, right? So if we want to store those in an array, then we need to have a dynamically allocated array because we don't know how many students there will be in the file before we read it. And so what we did last time was we used a vector. And even though the vector was allocated on the stack, internally, the vector has a heap allocated array that it manages the size of. Okay, so a vector gets allocated on the stack, but the internal array of a vector gets allocated on the heap. And we'll show an example of that later. We'll actually do a little bit of an example of that. Okie dokie. So heap memory. There is much, much more um, space available on the heap memory than the stack. It, you can pretty much, without going into a lot of details, essentially how much RAM you have is how much heap memory you have, okay? Um, so that's where, that's where all that, like when you see programs that have gigabytes of RAM usage, that's mostly coming from the heap. You allocate heap memory via the new keyword. So you would say type variable name equals new type. Okay. Oh, sorry, that is wrong. I am going to fix that. There we go. There has to be a pointer variable. So type 
pointer var name equals new type. Under the hood, this new keyword, if you're used to C, this calls malloc or the memory allocation function. But we're not going to get into malloc. We don't need it. I, I am a very b strong believer in top-down teaching of C++. We don't need malloc, and so nothing we don't need, we will teach. The operating system, when you call new, it calls malloc, and then depending on the compiler and the operating system, the OS will find a contiguous chunk of memory, meaning enough memory in a row for that allocation, and it will return a pointer to that memory. We'll talk about pointers in a bit. This is actually a very complicated and expensive operation. Calling new is expensive, and we want to avoid that if possible, but we'll get into that later in the course. It's fine for now. And then what you do is you can access the memory via a pointer. So let's look at an example of that. Um, someone just said in the chat they had a question. Is it possible to pop just one part of the point? No. So because that was um, allocated as a point, the entire point gets deallocated at once. All right. And as far as I know, when you leave a block of code, there's no way to actually go back and do something in between the deallocations. Just all the deallocations happen. The, the language takes care of that for you. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the stack and the heap side by side and look at some pointers as well. Okay, so this is the stack. The stack lives in memory somewhere. We just saw an example of that. Now, we also have the heap. So in practice, the heap and the stack in your physical RAM are going to live in completely separate areas, right? Now, when it comes to the heap, these you can picture these as like slots in RAM, okay? And so these are like, they're slots in RAM of a particular size. For, for our case now, we're going to pretend that each slot in the RAM, each memory address can hold an integer, okay? We will fix this later. Um, oh, I don't want to have that there right now, so I've got to close this. I don't know how to discard my changes. All right, so let's go through this example. And also, what we have done is, and we'll talk about pointers, but pointers are essentially just memory addresses, okay? A pointer is an address to memory. It's essentially an integer. So let me repeat that. A pointer is just an integer or an unsigned integer, which is an address in RAM, okay? So what I've done here uh, is I've put down some fake addresses in the heap just so we can refer to those. Okay, so in actual fact, the addresses of RAM are like 32-bit integers, but I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to, oh geez, one second, sorry about that. I'm just going to label these 1 through 5, and where you see OX whatever, this is like fake hexadecimal, right? So this is memory address 1 in the heap, 2 in the heap, 3 in the heap, and they would go up to like billions, right? Because you have gigabytes of RAM. So what happens now? when we run through this program. All right. So the first thing, just like before, int i gets allocated on the stack because we haven't used the new keyword, okay? So down here, we see i has been allocated on the stack, right? So this is i right here. We go to the next line of code, and then j gets allocated on the stack as well. On the stack lives the value of 10. Now. The next thing that's going to happen is going to be the big difference, okay? Instead of allocating the pointer values on the, sorry, the point values on the stack, what's going to happen is the pointer itself, the value of the pointer, which is an address, is going to be put on the stack. And the data is going to be put on the heap at that address, okay? So here's what happens. When we say pointer or point p, right, we, we give it this pointer equals new point, and I've just renamed it so it's a bit smaller here. We've given it the values of 5 and 4. So we said, hey heap, I want to allocate space on the heap 
for a point that has five and four as the data. Okay? So, what happens is the heap or the new operator calls malloc, the operating system says, hey, I have found space for this data structure. I have found a contiguous space in memory. That contiguous space is addresses one and two. I'm going to return you a pointer of where this thing lives, okay? So the pointer P stores the value of OX1. The pointer stores the address. And then this up here, um, is the address where that point is stored on the heap, okay? So the pointer, which is the address, is stored on the stack, but the object we allocated is stored on the heap. And the place that it was allocated on the heap, that is the address, all right? So the pointer points to the data on the stack. That's why it's called a pointer. It is literally just an address. Now, we're gonna keep going. We're gonna allocate this statically sized array, okay, and we can do this in, with this syntax in uh, C++. Give it the values of three and four. Those values are pushed onto the stack, okay. So, now we're going to exit the block of code and we're going to see what happens, all right? If this is all we have done, then the following happens. Because this is a stack, the last thing that was pushed on was the array. So we're gonna pop the array off the stack. It no longer lives there. The next thing that was put onto the stack was the pointer. So we pop the pointer off the stack. The next thing was the value of J, and the next thing was the value of I. But here's the problem. Our heap memory is still allocated. It's still living on the heap, okay? And so this is a memory leak. Let's pretend that this function was a function that gets called 60 times per second in a video game, okay? That means that every time you call this function, it's allocating memory on the heap right here, okay? The next one might go here, the next one might go here, but you are not getting rid of that memory. So here is where C's manual, or C++'s manual memory management comes in. Whenever we allocate memory on the heap, we have to allocate memory, or we have to deallocate that memory later, okay? So, I just got a question, which is a good question. The question was, why was there no address for the stack at OX2, okay? The reason was, the pointer always gives you the address of the beginning of the memory, okay? And then the program Later on, when we look at pointer syntax and stuff, it will figure out that the four, like the, the program figures out that the four lives here, okay? And, and I'll get into more of that, more of those examples in the future. Um, okay. Someone else asked, what happens for PTP equals new PT54? If there is no star, then it's a syntax error. You cannot allocate memory like that. So that won't compile. So the problem is the heap memory is still allocated. So we have to manually delete it, okay? So we delete the pointer. Well, we delete the heap allocation. We free the memory by calling delete p, all right? So once we delete p, that will be fine. Now, uh, once, now that I'm done this, let me go back uh, to look at some questions. If you assigned a new value to ox1, would it override the previously stored? So we'll get into that example, okay? But yes, if here I stored a new value at OX1 somehow, then it would actually overwrite the data that was in this point. So the, the, one of the dangerous things and powerful things about C and C++ is that we can write values to memory addresses wherever we want. And so if I just happen to overwrite the value of memory of OX1 by 51, then now my point would be 51 comma four, right? So this is really powerful, but really dangerous. And so we're gonna try and avoid doing that. But yes, it is possible to overwrite heap memory wherever we want. Now with some exceptions, operating system permissions and stuff like that. Okay. 
Is there a way to create PT in heap, but those values five, four in the stack? No, not if you stack allocate it, or not if you heap allocate it with the new pointer. Okay, so the memory layout of C++ is actually quite complicated, okay? So for example, in Linux, um, we have the stack, which lives at higher memory. Um, we have like, these are like auto variables for main, the argc, argv, system stuff. We have shared libraries and all this kind of stuff that we don't need to know the details of, okay? All of these are operating system and compiler specific. A lot of the details of this won't matter for the course. Just realize that if you go to, to some website um, and it tells you about the stack and the heap, it's not gonna look like this, right? This is just an abstract view. So remember, stack memory is fast, but very limited. Heap memory is slow, but much larger and has to be allocated via the new keyword. All right. So this is sort of what the actual C++ memory layout looks like, is that stack variable addresses will grow upward and heap variable addresses, well, we won't talk about how they grow. So I got a new um, question. Does every class need to be created using new? No. So you weren't here for the beginning of class and going forward, I won't be answering questions that I've already uh, answered in the beginning of the lecture. So classes can be allocated on the stack just like any other variable. The danger is if they're very big, um, you might not have enough memory for them. So C++ pointers. Oops. For, for all practical purposes for this course, they are identical to pointers in C. And so if you have used pointers in C, you have a leg up. A pointer just stores a memory address, like I said before. That OX1 or the OXFFAB724001, it's just a pointer to memory. And we're gonna do a live coding session where we actually see the memory. Modify, modifying the pointer variable modifies the address that it points to. So if I just modify the pointer variable, the data does not change. To modify the value that the, the value of the data in memory that the pointer points to, we have to dereference it. Okay? And so raw pointers like this can be very unsafe. And we are going to do our best to avoid them in this course, and we will not need them at all in this course. So let's look um, at this again. All right, so now. We are just looking at the stack. So the stack has memory addresses too. I just left them out last time, okay? Let's look at this slightly more convoluted example. So here, uh, here's how we use pointers and the syntax around pointers. So the first line, you're very familiar with this. Uh, and I'm growing the stack downwards now, okay? Just, just to keep in line with, with other things. So I've got a locally stack allocated int variable with a value of six. So on my stack, I just have a value of six. That is what I is referring to. Next, I'm going to allocate a pointer, call it P. And pointers have to be given types in C++. There's void pointers, but we're not gonna go into that. Um, so this P is a pointer to an integer. So that's all we've done. We've set up a pointer to an integer. And in C++, if you're running in release mode and you do not give a variable a value, then its value is whatever electric bytes happen to be in RAM at that time, okay? So it is actually undefined what this pointer is currently pointing to. So a good rule when you're using C++ is if you if you um, allocate a new variable, give it a default value, okay? So for example, if I hadn't given six a value, or if I hadn't given i a value, this would essentially be random. It would be whatever happened to be in memory at that time, like whatever stardust came through your RAM. Okay, so we have set up a pointer to an integer, but we haven't given it an address yet. It's just, okay, a pointer to an integer lives here. Now, let's say that we want the pointer to point to the i variable. 
So what we do now is we use the ampersand symbol, and this is when it is used before a variable name. In this context, it is the address of variable. So what we say here is we are going to set the value of p to the address of i. Okay, so this is the address of operator. So over here, the value of p on the stack is now ox1, which is the memory address of i. Okay, now let's say that we want to set the value of the memory that p points to. I can't just say p equals 7, because what will happen then is that the pointer will be changed to 7, and it will be interpreting that as a memory address, right? So what I have to do is use the star operator before the p variable in order to look up or dereference what lives in memory at that memory location and then set that equal to 7. So if I say star p equals 7, then it dereferences the memory address, which is ox1. It looks up here and changes that memory value to 7. Okay? And now if I print out i, it will actually print 7. So we have modified the memory directly through the pointer. All right? Now, the concept that pointers are addresses is not a difficult concept to grasp. Usually, the implementation problem that people have is that it's the syntax surrounding pointers, okay? So here, this is pretty easy. All languages have this, right? But the problem with pointers and referencing and ad getting addresses of stuff is that a lot of the operators are overloaded, meaning that a lot of the same characters do different things depending on where you are. So here, we use the star operator. It's not an operator here, okay? This is saying I want a pointer to an integer. Here, I'm saying p equals ampersand i, which is the address of operator when used in this context, next to a variable like this. Here, I'm saying I'm using the, the ampersand, or sorry, I'm using the star again, but this is actually a different thing. This is dereference the variable p and set it equal to 7. So I know this is a little bit confusing because the same symbol is used, and I wish that C++ had its own dereference symbol and its own address of symbol. But C++ being what it is actually overloads these terms a little bit. So the concept of a pointer being a memory address is simple, but you'll just have to get used to through muscle memory and experimentation um, actually getting used to the symbols, okay? So someone just said in the chat, uh, I think PTP is a new syntax error. Yes, I've already said that's a syntax error. Does that mean that P is still considered a pointer? Like if you set it equal to something without the star, will it again interpret it as a memory address? So yes, I already just said that as well. So here, if I had said P equals 10, right? Then the value of 10 would go here as the memory address. And when I went to dereference this, it would look in memory address 10, okay? All right. So let's go on to a slightly more complex, like so, so now we know what a pointer is. Now we're gonna show how arrays are represented as pointers, okay? So if we call this line of code, int star array equals new int three. So what this is doing is says, I want a pointer to an integer variable. And that variable is going to be called r, or arr. Now I'm going to call the heap to allocate spots, three spots for this. Okay? So what happens is um, this is essentially an array of size three. So what happens, we call this variable, or sorry, we call new. The operating system calls its malloc. And it looks in the heap and it finds, oh, hey, I have space for three integers in a row at memory address ox1, right? 
So at memory address ox1, that is what the value of this pointer gets. So arr is given the value of the memory address where the new operator found memory. And so this is the address of the array. You can think about it in that way, okay? Now, here is some different syntax that you could use to call places in the array. So I can say arr0 equals five. And what will happen is it will look up the first element of the array, the zeroth element, and set it equal to five. Then I can call arr1 equals 10, and it will set the oneth or second element of the array equal to, zero, equal to 10. Now, this operator here, how we've looked at that in other programming languages, you've probably just thought of that as, give me the element of the array, okay? But, Here's something really interesting, and I'll bring up the blackboard for this. Give me a second. Oh dear. Um, I have to clear my blackboard from the previous class, so give me a sec. Okay, so blackboard, here we go. We're in the, we're in the classroom now, right? So if I have... Um, Give me my brush. Give me my brush. Okay, so over here I have some memory, right? Let's say this is my array. This is my array. Let's say this is like OX1, OX2, right? So this is address one, address two. Oh no, it's going off, off the rails. What's going off? Save me. Oh no, okay. One second, I gotta copy and paste this over. There we go. All right, we're just gonna have a little white spot over here. So this is my array. This is a, oh jeez. All right, we're doing it live. A, R, R, okay? So if I say int star, a R R, right? Now I call the heap, so A R R is pointing at this memory address, right? So I've got an array of size three. I've got some values in here. I don't have values set yet, so they're all kind of random. So I have int A R R, that points to the beginning of the array. So if I say A R R zero, right? This points to the zeroth element. If I say arr1, this says this element. arr2 is this element, okay? So you're all used to that. But let's go back and look at some pointer arithmetic, if you will. So I can type like this now. So if I say arr0, what does that actually mean? Well, let's use pointer dereferencing to get the first element of the array. So if the array starts here, then arr is just the address of the array, right? That's the address of the first element of the array. So if I just say star arr equals seven, then that will put a seven up here, okay? That's because I've taken the memory address, dereferenced it, and then put a seven there. So a seven lives there. So if I say stir and then arr plus one equals 10, then what this will do is it looks up the memory address of arr, it skips ahead by one, and it puts a 10 in there. So I can manually access this memory in the array like this. This is exactly equivalent to arr1 equals 10, okay? Similarly, if I wanted to get at the nth element of the array, so if I say arrn equals value, 
That's exactly the same as dereferencing the pointer ARR plus N skips ahead equals value. Okay? So, the really cool thing about this is that if ARRN equals dereference ARR plus N and addition is transitive, then we can actually say dereference n plus arr equals value. But we could also say, if we translate this back, then we can actually do this in C++. And it's confusing and never, never, never use that syntax, but all of this math is equivalent. Okay? So it's really funny that you can refer to the memory address in either way. All right? So, now, that's how we do this. Okay, so if we go back to the slide in the PowerPoint, now what we can do, if we want to set element two of the array to 20, and we don't want to use the square bracket uh, syntax, we can say, hey, I know that array ARR points to right here. I want to skip ahead two, so I'm going to add 2 to it, and I want to modify the memory, so I'm going to dereference it, and then set that equal to 20. Okay? So again, I put this in the slides because you won't have the blackboard in the slides. So ARRN is equivalent to dereference the memory at array, which is a pointer, plus n, which is equivalent to this, right? And so there's lots of things we can do. Um, to mix and match this syntax, but this is just how it works underneath and that's how pointers work Now let's do the same thing with just the stack Okay, so we can do we can use pointers and arrays on the stack as well So here's only using the stack. I'll allocate on the stack an array of size 3 notice that there's no keyword here Okay, there's no new keyword. So all these values go onto the stack Initially, they have blank values. They're kind of random. So I can say ARR0 equals 5, and then right on the stack, that value gets written. ARR1 equals 10, right on the stack, that gets written. And even if you have a statically allocated array without the variable, like without the pointer, whenever you indicate a, an array is the variable type with these brackets, it automatically becomes a pointer, okay? So I can still say dereference the thing that lives at the pointer ARR plus two and set that equal to 20. And so the same syntax works if the array is on the stack or on the heap. It's just that where the memory lives is different, right? Okay, so any questions you have, you can, you can ask them in the chat, but I think that once you go over that and you look at it again, it can be fine. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over a live programming example of this. So here I have uh, my terminal set up, and this is set up in the same way as last time, so I will not be explaining how I set this up. I have a blank C++ program, and what I'm going to do is the following, okay? So I'm going to have int uh, value equals 20. All right, now, if I standard C out um, value, or actually, let me just say this is uh, V. So V equals, and then I'll print out V, and then I'll print out a new line, right? And then I'll return zero, because I want to be good. Okay, very, very simple C++ program. What should be the output? It's 20. Okay, so V equals 20, right? Okie doke. Now, let's set up an integer pointer. I'll call that PV for pointer to V. And so I will set that as the address of V. Okay, so the syntax here I'm going to have a pointer to an integer. The variable is called PV, 
and I'm going to set that equal to the address of V. Okay? So I'm going to print out that. So down here, I'm going to say standard C out PV equals, and I will print out the pointer. So this will print out the value of PV. And what will that be? It is a memory address. Okay? So this is just where it happens to live in memory. Okay, so the stack begins somewhere in memory, and the pointer to this variable just happens to be wherever in the stack that that was allocated. Okay, I've, I see like six or seven questions in the chat. I'm not going to be answering them yet. I'll answer them when I'm done this example. Okay, so let's say now that after I've done this, I want to modify the value of V, right? So if now I could say V equals 30 if I want to, but let's modify it via the pointer. So I can say dereference PV, so that looks up where it lives in memory, and then set that value equal to 33, okay? Now I will copy these lines and paste them. So what's gonna happen? is that it will print out v equals 20, it will print out the pointer to v, then it will print out, hopefully, 33, because we have changed the value of the memory address, right? We've changed the data that lives at the memory address of v to 33, but we have not changed the pointer itself, okay? So if we print this out, we see v equals 20, here's the memory address, then v equals 33, and the memory address has stayed the same. Okay? Now, let's do something a little bit cooler. Let's have um, int u equals 50. All right? Now, int star pu equals the address of u. So we've done the same thing as v, it's just we've just given it another variable, okay? So down here, I'm going to uh, copy these and paste them. So u is equal to u, and I'll print that out. And down here, the pointer to u is equal to this. Okay, so I'm gonna run this and we'll see something interesting. So v is equal to 20, and here's the pointer. This is a memory address, and this is in bytes, okay? So this is in bytes, remember that. Then u is given the value of 50. Now, if you look at this memory address, it's almost the same, except it has increased by four. Why is it four? It's because an integer is four bytes. And so if you allocate one integer on the stack, and then you allocate another integer on the stack right next to it, its memory address will be four past, okay, four higher. So we've essentially put this integer on top of the other integer on the stack, all right? So now what I could do, if I really want to, let's do something crazy. So I've got an integer pointer, PU, right? Let's do something really dangerous. If I subtract one integer pointer from PU, and dereference that and set this equal to 77. So remember, PU is the pointer to U, but I'm modifying the address. So let's take all these values and we're gonna put them down here. And now let's see what happens. So we said V equals 20. Here's the pointer to V, and you can see how these addresses are actually different now. So every time you run the program, you might get different addresses. U equals 50, here's the address to U. Now, I modified, I took the value of the pointer to U and did something with it. So why did V change? It's because I took the memory address of U, I took the pointer of U, I subtracted one from it, and whenever you subtract one from a pointer, it subtracts the number of bytes of the type of the pointer. So that would be four bytes. So I subtract four bytes from this, 
I get this, which just so happens to be the address of V. And so even though I called PU, it was V that got changed. Isn't that crazy? So I know that seems a little bit like complicated at first, but it's just integers and memory addresses. All right, now let's do something else. Um, why 77 and not 20? Because right here I said, take the address of PU, so it's the address of U, subtract one from it, okay, which happens to be the address of V, and set that equal to 20, 77. Uh, another question. So you, can you do hacky stuff to make a pointer that lands between PU and PV so you can change a byte? Yes, you can. Um, I'm not going to do that right now because I don't know if it'll crash or not. And it depends on the, on the operating system. It depends on a whole bunch of things. But yes, you can change individual bytes in memory if you want to. Okay? But I'm not going to get into that right now. So let's do the same thing, but we're going to do it with arrays now. Okay, so I'm going to say int array, um, so I'm going to say s array. This is going to be a stack array, so it's a stack allocated array of size 10. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to for size t i equals 0, i less than 10, i plus plus. So I'm going to go through this array and I'm going to do something with it, okay? I'm going to print out the value of the array, so what's actually stored in data in the array, and I'm also going to print out the address of the array. So let's see what happens there. So we're going to print out s r i, right? That's how I look at it. And then I'm going to print a new line. So I'm actually going to say value of index or value of s or value of array i and then i'll do this okay that should be fine right that'll work yes and see out i can say address of array i Now, if I want to get the address of this array's ith index, I can do it one of many ways. First, what I could do is I could say sr plus i, right? sr is just a pointer, remember. So I could just add 1 to it, or sorry, not 1. I could add i to it to get the address of the ith element of the array. Similarly, I could call sri and then get the address of it, right? So there's all sorts of different ways that you can actually get and set memory like this. All right, so let's just call it like this. And I want to actually, this is address, this is the first. And I'll show you that these will be the same, okay? Plus i, there we go. So now when I run this, okay, so let's scroll up a little bit. Value of array 0, 4545, what the hell? I, I didn't set any values here. This is 0, this is 1184, oh yeah. If I don't give stack allocated values or heap allocated values a default value when I allocate them, then they just get whatever randomness happens to be in memory, okay? This is, you might assume if you're coming from Python or Java that they're given zero by default. No, no, no. C++ is all about speed. C++ doesn't have time to set things to zero, okay? You said give me space for 10 integers. You didn't say set them all to zero, okay? So what I could do here is I could set some values by saying one, two, three, four, blah, 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 blah. But what I'll do is I'll use this. I like this syntax. So this is, um, this says give it the default values of zero, okay? 
So all my values are now zero. That's an easy way of just giving them values of zero. Similarly, if I went down here and then said s array i equals i, then my values, let's say I actually give it a value of i times 100. And so now when I print out the value, uh, zero will have zero, one will have 100, two will have 200, okay? But if I look, the addresses are the same, right? So the address, uh, I just printed them out in two different ways. Here's the address of the first index of the array. Here's the address of the second index of the array. Here's the address of the third index, the fourth. And if we look at it, each of these is just adding the size of an integer or four bytes to the address of the previous one, okay? And since this array was allocated on the stack, then these values are on the stack. So now what I'm gonna do is have a heap array equals new int 10. All right, so this says, hey, heap, give me space for 10 integers, right? And it's gonna to go to the heap. So what I'm gonna do here um, is I'm gonna change this just a little bit. So I'm gonna put in a couple of new things. So the value of s array and the address of s array, right? Now I'm going to say, copy that put these here, I'm gonna have the value of the heap array and the value or, yeah, and the address of the heap array. So over here, I have to change this to H and I have to change this to H, okay? So let's run this again. Now, if I look, when I call new on the heap allocated array, it does give it values of zero. I think it always does. I'm not 100% sure. Someone might be able to correct me on that, but I think that when you allocate new on an array like that, it actually has the default constructor for everything, so there's zeros for integers. So, the value of the stack array at zero is zero. The value of the heap array is zero. But if we look at the pointers, okay, the address of the first index of the stack array and the address of the first index of the heap array, they're completely different. They are in different areas of the RAM by billions of addresses, okay? Because the stack and the heap are allocated in completely different places in there. So if I then go to one, the value of the, st of the stack array is 100 because I said explicitly I want it to be i times 100. The value of, sorry, the address of the first index is four more than the previous index of the stack array. Now, even though the heap lives somewhere else completely in memory, its values are contiguous with each other, right? So the second element of the heap array is right next to the first element of the heap array. Okay? See how that goes? Alrighty. Now, let's see what I had for, yeah. So that's what I wanted to talk about in terms of pointers. Um, now, if I exit this program, I will have 10, 40 bytes of memory, right? So if I delete all this, when I get to right here, as I said previously in the lecture, um, my stack allocated array will destroy itself. Everything on the stack gets destroyed, but things on the heap do not get destroyed, okay? So what I need to do is call delete on this. And the syntax for deleting, so if I have just a single value, so if I have int star p here, and I want to deallocate the memory for that, I say delete p. If I want to delete everything in the array, then I say delete array h array. Okay, so that's the syntax for doing that. But you can see now how easy it is 
to have memory leaks in C++. Because if I go up here and I have a function, right, this function foo, and in here I say int um, star array equals new int 100 or 1000 even, and then I exit the function without deleting it, every single time I call that function, I leak 40 kilobytes of memory. Okay, so I have to be very sure about that. But as this lecture goes on, you're going you're gonna to realize that we don't need to worry about that so much because we're not going to use raw pointers because they're unsafe. And you've seen why they're so unsafe because you can access anything and delete anything and it is completely bonkers. Okay, so that's pointers. That's pretty much all you need to know about pointers. So we'll keep going on. And for people who have questions, you can go back and you can watch the VOD. That'll be available, especially for people in the class. Okay? You have to delete before return, because if you don't, then those variables are lost to time. Okay? Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of questions up there that are very specific to what I was talking about before, so I'll just keep going on. Every array in C++ gets allocated contiguous memory, whether it's on the stack or on the heap. It has to find contiguous memory in order to allocate it. And we'll talk about why contiguous memory matters a lot more in the future of the course. So, if pointers are so unsafe, why the hell would we use them? Why am I teaching them? Okay. Well, we must use a pointer for inheritance. Okay. And the reason for that is the following. So if we have inheritance and we have a base class, right? You all know what object-oriented programming is. I have to say, if I want to set up a base pointer, if I want to set a base variable equal to a derived class, then I have to say base pointer pointer equals new derived, okay? And the reason for that is because the pointer is allocated on the stack, okay? And the pointer, or sorry, the base class and the derived class may have different sizes. The derived class might be way bigger than the base class. And so you can't allocate a derived class as a base class as a raw stack allocated variable because the sizes may be different, okay? So you have to use a pointer. You can also use a reference, but we haven't gotten a reference yet. Also, passed by value versus passed by reference. So if we want to modify a variable passed into a function, we have to use pass by value versus pass by reference, right? So, um, also when pointing to large data, large data can't live on the stack. Okie dokie. Now, references are different than pointers, but they are essentially just safe pointers, okay? So wherever we used star to allocate a pointer, we have to use ampersand to allocate a reference. And oh my god, could they have chosen a worse symbol to use for reference. It's terrible. It's overloaded so much. But you just have to get used to it. I'm sorry, I didn't make C++. The difference between a pointer and a reference is the following. A reference must point to existing data and can never point to a null pointer. This makes them almost always safe. So prefer using references to pointers wherever possible in our code. So I'm gonna do this a couple more slides and I'm gonna go back to the live, oh my God, I've been, I haven't been on the slides. I'm so sorry. Ah, PowerPoint, all right, sorry about that. Why isn't this going back? Yeah, so I gotta go over this again. Yeah, thank you for letting me know. Uh, people weren't fast enough. So you have to use pointers for inheritance. So you have to say base star pointer equals new derived. We want to use them when we pass by value versus pass by reference. And we have to use them when we're passing large data. And we're going to get in into a coding example of that. And this, refer this class might go 15 or 20 minutes late, but it's cool because we're talking about pointers and pointers are awesome. So references, repeating what I just said, are essentially safe pointers. So instead of the star, we use an ampersand. And a reference must point to something. It can't just point to any memory address. And we want to prefer using references to pointers wherever possible. 
So, pass by value versus pass by reference. In default, C++ passes everything by value. And actually, it literally does pass everything by value. Pass by value has a huge cost for copying large data. And so you may want to modify the value that's passed. And so we can use pointers to accomplish pass by reference. But ideally, we want to use the reference. And I'll show you this now, okay? So let's say we have a function like this. And I just have this in the slides because I don't want to have to type this out. I have my main function. I set up an int value of 12, right? Now I'm going to call my function tenify on i. And I'm going to print out the value of i. Well, if I call tenify in this form, and I call it on int a, what happens is this. It's passed by value. So what I've done is I've passed in a copy of a. Then I modify this local copy of a and this version of i back out here in the main will not be modified. So this will print out 12, okay? But let's say I want to pass in a value into a function, right? So let's try passing by pointer. So now my tenify function is going to get passed in a pointer to an integer. And I'm going to modify it by dereferencing the pointer, looking up in memory where it lives, and setting that value equal to 10. So the only change I need down here now is that when I go to call tenify, it's expecting a pointer. So I have to get the address of i, okay? So then when I, when I run this and I print out i, this will print out 10 because I passed in an address and then modified the data that lived at the address. Okay. But be careful, okay? Who in chat has heard of a null pointer exception, right? I'm sure if you've, <laughs> if you've gone in Java, Java does, the, uh, does you the service of telling you there was a null pointer exception. In C++, we just crash, what is it, a seg fault maybe, right? So if this function gets passed in, this can literally get passed in any pointer. But if it was pointing to garbage and we try and change it, then you're done, right? And the program at, at best may crash, okay? At worst, you're modifying the value of something in memory that you don't know about, and now you have undefined results later, right? And you start detecting chicken faces instead of uh, human faces in your, in your uh, genetic algorithm or whatever, or your, your neural net. So here's pass by reference, which we prefer because it's safer, okay? So a, another version of tenify, okay? We're gonna pass in a reference to an integer. And this is the reference symbol. Unfortunately, it's overloaded, okay? When we have a reference, we no longer have to dereference the reference. We only dereference pointers. Oh my god, C++, could you be any more stupid? But anyway, we can just reference, we can just say a equals 10. And since a is a reference, it will change the value that it's pointing to. Okay. And we no longer have to get the address of down here. So if we're passing in a reference, it no longer copies. And down here, the tenify function works as expected, and we will print out 10. And we were pretty much guaranteed, guaranteed within like normal programming, that this reference will always be valid. Okay, so let's talk about big data, right? Let's say we have our magic function, machine learn, and it takes in some big data, and that big data D is here. If I call, if I set up my big data, and then just call machine learn on the data, then I'm copying my big data into this function. So if that was a few gigabytes, then that few gigabytes gets copied, right? That's not what I want. I want to pass that big data by a reference, and ideally by a const reference, because this machine learning function, we don't want to change the data. And so I'm going to say I'm passing in a const reference to a big data object called D, okay? And then that will, the only thing that gets copied is the reference, not the actual big data object. So here's a bit of a rule. 
Whenever we pass a variable to a function that we don't want to be modified, always, almost always, use a const reference. Okay? Const declares that the variable cannot be modified inside the called function. We only have to pass the 8-byte reference without worrying about modifying it. Here's the exception. Okay? Pass primitive data types by value. So, if we were to have like a function that's just adding two primitive data types, like ints, floats, doubles, chars, that kind of thing, do not use a reference for that. We can copy the data in there. Why? Because when we have a reference, there is an extra dereferencing step that is actually a bit slower when using primitives. Okay? And we haven't talked about shared pointer, but pass shared pointers by value as well. So we pass primitive types by value, and we pass smart pointers by value. Okay, we'll get to what that means in a minute. Now, let's see. I gotta bring up my, my notepad. Okay, so the concept of RAII, very, very important. RAII stands for Resource Acquisition is Initialization. Oh my god, what the hell does that mean? Well, it means that it binds the life cycle of a resource that must be acquired before use to the lifetime of an object. What in the hell does that mean, Dave? Well, it makes life easier by implementing things in a way that automatically manages memory and resources for us. So this will be really, really cool. So, the way we implement our AII is we are going to encapsulate our resources into a class, right? So, we'll give an example of this. The class constructor is going to acquire the resource and initialize it. And the class destructor is going to release the resource properly. So the class itself should be instantiated such that it either has an automatic storage duration or is in another RAII object. So what in the hell do we mean about that? Well, here's an example, okay? Actually, let me go to the live programming for this because I think it's more fun to go to live programming. All right, so we have int star array equals new int 100, right? So if I told you make an array of size 100, that's how you would do it. And then down here, when you exited, well, if you haven't deleted it, then it just gets, it's lost to time, right? It's a memory leak. But let's implement this as RAII. And so the RAII way of doing this is to create a class that manages the memory for me. Okay, now also keep in mind, that if I have a my class C, classes that are stack allocated have their destructors called when they go out of scope. That's very important. All right, so let's do this. Let's use the int array as a good example. So I'm going to have class int array, right? So this is my class. Now down here, I'm going to have as, well, I'm going to declare public. So my int array constructor is public, and let's say that that takes in a size. Uh, num, or size, um, size, there we go. Now, what's going to happen here in the constructor, now I'm not gonna use an initializer list just because I wanna be very clear with what I'm doing, okay? So in private, I'm going to have an int star array, okay? Well, m array. So this is my array, and I'm gonna be good and set this initially equal to a null pointer, okay? So there's the int array that I'm gonna be working with, but I'm encapsulating it within a class to make it memory safe, and I'll show you how this works. So down here, I'm going to call new. So when I get my size in in the constructor, I'll say m array equals new int, 
and I'll say size. Okay, so now I've constructed it, right? But here's where the RAII comes in. So in the constructor, I acquire the resource. So I initialize the memory. Then in the destructor, this is how you specify the destructor. This will get called whenever this object goes out of scope. So here I would call delete m array. Okay, so what does that do? Well, now down here, I can say int array my array and I'll give it a value of 100. But look what happens. That constructor gets the resource. It calls the new, right? But then when I get down to the end of this function, the destructor calls delete for me, okay? So I don't need to worry about calling delete because the function, all that functionality we've wrapped inside the class itself, okay? So that's our AII and it's extremely important and it's why going forward into this course, we will never have to call delete, okay? Wouldn't all that happen to the array even without a class? So again, if we said int array 100 and we allocated it on the stack, then it would be fine because stack variables get, stack variables get um, cleaned up. But if I said int star array equals new int 100, that is allocated on the heap, and that manually has to be freed or the memory is lost forever, okay? So what we did was we took this concept of a dynamically sized array and we wrapped it inside a class. And that class is going to be perfectly safe to use forever and ever. All right, so that's what RAII is. Um, now, you may have noticed that we actually have no way of getting at the, the values of these array, but don't worry. All righty. Um, so over here, if I go back to the PowerPoint, you see, you see here that I've put this in the slides, okay? Um, where I have int array, memory is allocated, I can do things to the array, and then it destructs, and my memory is deallocated. Now, I want to talk about first, really quickly, that if I wanted to get at these values in here, right, then I would have to, like, um, okay, if I actually want to access the values of my array, what would I have to do? Well, I could do something like this, where I know that they are ints, right? So I could have an int get value, or just int get, and then size t index, and then here I would say return m, oh, sorry, thank you. Okay, I'm just saying here, if I want to get at values of this array, right? So I can return m array index, that will let me get values. Also, I can have a function which lets me set values set values, size t index, and then int value, right? So now I can say m array index equals value. Okay, so down here, wherever I use my array, whenever I want to, to get something, I can say my array dot get 30, and that will give me the int, or I can say my array dot set, um, the index of 30, the value of 100, um, and then that will set it. Now, that's kind of the Java way of doing it, right? Here's something I'm going to teach you, which may be later in the slides, but let's just get it over with. Let's just say that I wanted to only have one function, which is get. Here's a cool thing. In C++, if I return a reference to an integer, this is like returning a pointer, right? So what I could do down here is say my array dot get 30 equals 10,000. And this will actually set index 30 of the thing in the array to 10,000. See how that works? So because I'm returning a pointer, which or I'm returning a reference, 
which is essentially a pointer. Here, I can set values via the get function. So, why would I want to do something like that? Well, something that's really cool that we can do is called operator overloading. So, I can actually define all C++ operators and what they do on a class. So, for example, if I wanted to be able to use this as a normal array and do something like my array uh, 50 equals 10, right? Well, in C++, this, these brackets are actually an operator. So what does that operator do? Well, that operator is going to return an integer reference. Now we specify operator brackets, okay? And now, as an input to that operator, we have the unsigned integer index. And then all we have to do here is return um, m array index. Okay. So here, this will work. So if I have standard c out my array 50, and then a new line, hopefully. This all works. I've probably made a typo. Oh, look at that. It worked, right? So the custom class that I wrote, I can call square brackets on it. I can call plus on it if I want to. I can call minus on it. It's just defined as any other function in the language, okay? So that's a really cool thing about C++ and it makes things really compact, but also it makes it really dangerous. Because if you see someone else's code that has this square bracket operator, right, you might think, oh, that just gets something from an array. But up here, this could be like, um, like delete all files in C windows, right? So that is a problem, is that the fact that if you're just reading someone else's code, you don't, you don't know exactly what it'll do. Now, um, We'll talk about cons correctness later, but this is as far as we need to go for that topic. Okay, now let's go back to the PowerPoint slides. I like this ability to go back and forth really easily, especially when I remember the tab back, right? Okay, so technically we are past the time of the course, but I'm just gonna get it all out there. And then the rest of the lectures um, for the class, I promise you will be on time. All right, it always has been, yeah. So. C++ smart pointers. It can be really cumbersome. So let's say, for example, we want to make an RAI object for every single class that we have, right? So that when I allocate it with new, it will deallocate it automatically. That's going to be super, super annoying, right? So this is where smart pointers come in. So it can be really cumbersome to create our own RAII classes for every data type that we want to store a pointer to. Luckily, C++ contains different smart pointers. Okay. In this class, we will only be using shared pointer, standard shared pointer. People who are C++ purists or super optimizers are going to yell at me for this because there are unique pointers, there are different kinds of pointers. But this course is designed to get you off the ground and running with something that'll work and be sort of fast, okay? So we're gonna use shared pointer and we're not gonna complain about it because it'll do lots of cool stuff for it for not much overhead. Shared pointers are going to use RAII for given pointer types. I just had a question, will you get mad at us if we use unique pointers in our assignments? You cannot use unique pointers in the assignments because all of the skeleton code uses standard uses shared pointers. So just go with it. All right, so you will be wrong if you try and mix them. How about that? So a shared pointer is essentially a reference counted pointer, okay? And what this means is that it's RAII, you pass into the constructor, you pass a pointer that it's going to own, okay? As soon as you construct it, its internal counter is set to one in the constructor. Every time you copy the shared pointer, the counter is increased by one. Every time it gets destructed, the counter is decreased by one. And when the counter reaches zero, the resource is deallocated, okay? So, 
This is why we pass shared pointers by value. So in order to use shared pointer, we have to include memory. Here's an example. So this is one way to allocate a shared pointer. It's the wrong way, but it's one way. So we're going to say standard shared pointer my class. That is the syntax. So it's a standard shared pointer of the type my class. This is a template. We'll talk about templates later. We'll call that pointer p. And we will give it ownership to a new my class with some arguments. So we'll create a new my class and we'll pass that into the constructor of the shared pointer. Okay? This is the more intuitive way of thinking about it, so I'm showing this first. Now, at the time of this constructor, the internal count inside the shared pointer will be equal to one. Now, we are going to call func on this shared pointer. I don't know why I didn't call it here, but I should have called it. Okay, so let's pretend that I called func on the shared pointer. Now, when I call it, it gets copy constructed, and C++ copy constructor of shared pointer increments the count by one. So now the count is equal to two, right? Now we do something else, and then what happens? Well, the destructor of the shared pointer gets called, and the count gets decreased by one. So now the count is back to one. Down here, when we get back to our main function, we do some other things, and then the function terminates. And this counter goes from 1 to 0, and so the destructor of the shared pointer says, if the count is now at 0, let's free up the memory. Okay? And it can do this for any type. So when we go into talking about ECS, our entities will be using shared pointers to entities. And as long as we pass our shared pointers, in the correct way, we never ever have to worry about deallocating them. All right, so this will make things a lot easier. Now, here's the correct way, is that we, in C++, when we have to declare really, really, really long variable names like this, we can usually use auto, okay? So this will say auto p equals standard make shared my class with the arguments. So this is the preferred way of creating um, shared pointers to different types is to use standard make share. Okay, so um, that's shared pointers and we'll just be using them like that. It's not gonna be hard, you'll be able to do those really easily. So I don't need a live demo for that. Now, let's talk a little bit about C++ inheritance and the prerequisites for this course require that you know about inheritance, okay? So there are, the syntax is almost identical to languages like Java, uh, but there are three types of member variable types in C++. There are public, so public variables and functions can be seen by everyone. Private can be seen by nobody but the class itself, and protected can be seen by derived classes, okay? So you might have a situation where you have a private variable and you're like, why can't I see this from the derived class? Well, that has to be in the protected type, okay? So um, the syntax for creating a new class with inheritance is class derived colon public base, okay? If you say public, then nothing, ch nothing changes. Um, if you say protected, then base public things become protected. And if you say private, then base all things become private. So 99% of the time, just use public base, okay? And there's a really funny thing where, so if you have a class that you want to be able to see private variables in another class, you can say friend class other class. So friends can see your privates, but your children can't. Okay, that's a kind of a funny C++ quote, is that the, your children, so the derived classes are your children, they can't see your private variables but friend classes can see private variables. So I like that quote. Okie doke. Um, so how do we allocate data and how do we pass data when we're doing game programming, right? When we're doing this course, how do we pass data? If possible, use the stack. 
So if we have small primitive types or small local variables, we want to pass that local variable by a const reference if it is greater than eight bytes in size. Otherwise, we just pass it by value if it's eight bytes or smaller, okay? If you need heap memory, use a smart pointer. So we have a standard shared pointer T, my big data, or we have a standard shared pointer base equals standard make shared derived, okay? Um, only when absolutely necessary, use raw pointers and new. Um, this should not happen in this course. We are going to be using shared pointers anywhere. Hey, uh, thank you for answering some of the questions in the chat, uh, Strager. Okay. Now, I'm not going to do live coding for that, but I will talk a little bit about templates. Now, templates are extremely powerful. They are extremely complicated. We are going to keep it extremely simple in this course, okay? So they can be used to implement generics. And by generics, I mean, for example, when you see a standard vector T, this indicates generics, and it means that vector can be used to store whatever type that you want. And this means that this vector stores type T. So we're gonna do a coding example that's gonna show templates, and I encourage you to go out and see other um, examples of templates in the wild. But for now, I'm gonna shut down the PowerPoint, and I'm just gonna go back to the live coding, and I'm going to show what templates can do really, really, really basically, okay? So, here's how templates work. Remember when we had our class int array? Here we go. So we had our class int array, right? Now, what if we wanted a float array, or a double array, or any other, or a my class array? Are we going to rewrite this class for every single possible type that we want to store in an array. Of course we're not, okay? So what we're going to do, what we want to be able to do is use a template. So ideally, what we would have is something like my array, and then we give it a type like this, okay? So that's what we want this to be um, in the end. So what we'll do is we'll just live edit what we have here, and we'll call this my array. Now, this is the syntax for that. Is it this? Oh my God, please tell me I got that right. So you can say template type name T, or you can say template class T, okay? Um, yeah, so here, what I will do is wherever, say, wherever I said int, I'm gonna replace it with T. It's really that simple. So if I want to make this class use a, like any different type, then this is what's gonna happen. Ah, thank you. It's been a while since I did my own template. So I'm gonna use template class T. Thank you, chat, it's great. So down here, I have to change this, of course, to my array. And then down here, I have to change int to a T. So whatever I call this with, it will call the correct um, uh, new. So this again will be my array. I'll delete my array. And down here, whenever I want to get access to the thing, now I just have, I just call T, okay? So now down here, this should all just work. Yes, it did. And if I want to store down here, um, if this is gonna be a float array, and then this is 3.14159, then I print it out, then it will print the floating version of, okay? So that at a very, very, very basic level is what templates are mostly for, okay? Templates, you can get into template metaprogramming and you can have templates like compute Fibonacci numbers at compile time and all sorts of crazy nonsense that we're not gonna get into in this course but I just want you to know the syntax for that and one of the use cases where we would want to use templates, okay? Also, not only are they just for classes, but you can use them for functions as well, okay? So let's say, for example, we had a min function, and in this function, we had like int1 and int2, 
and we wanted to figure out so like uh, return um, we could say int one less than int two int one int two okay so this is the function All right, let me call this i1 and i2 Okay, so this is a good min function. Now, if I wanted this min function to operate on any type, right? Oh, geez, here's a, here's a typo. I can also say template class t, and in here I can pass in a t, and here I can pass in a t, and I can return a t, and I can do the exact same thing, right? And as long as t has the operator, less than defined on it, then I can do this. All right, so let me check my checklist. Um, yes, the last thing I wanted to show is something called const correctness. So at its heart, const correctness means wherever something is not being modified, you want to put in the const keyword, okay? So let's have an example function where on my array, I'm going to have a void function called print, okay? Inside this function, I'm going to say, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. oh, have I not stored the size? So here, uh, m size equals zero. Here I'm going to say m size equals size. And again, I'm not using a, um, uh, I might as well just use the initializer list, right? So m array new t size and uh, m size size. So let's do it properly, get the initializer lists. Okay, now for those who are asking, this is called a trigraph, I think. And it's, it's a really good thing when you have simple if statements and you want to return based on that. So C++ has this, Java has it, Python has it. Um, what you say is return, and then you ask a question. If this question, the conditional operator, okay, thank you. If this question is true, it returns the first thing. If it's false, it returns the second thing. Not a ternary operator. Ternary operators is an operator that has three things in it. Is it? I don't know. Anyway, whatever it's called, that's what it does. And I'm running out of time, so I don't want to. I don't want to delay on that. You can look up what that's called. So back to const correctness. Okay. Now, I want to print out this array. So what am I going to do? I'm going to have four size t i equals zero. I is less than m size i plus plus i'm going to print out standard c out um, m array i and then i'm going to print out a new line okay so each element of the array is going to get printed on a new line perfect that's what i want so down here what i'm going to do is i'm going to call this int 10 I'm gonna say this is a new int 10. I'm gonna say my array like five equals um, 77. And then I'm going to call my array dot print. And hopefully this does what I want. Oh geez. Okay, so yeah. The problem here was it gave me a warning and said that size is actually going to come before this. So I rearrange this and it's no problem. Okay, so it did exactly what I wanted, right? It printed out the array. It printed all zeros because I used new, so it allocates everything to zeros. And array 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is equal to 77. Now, let's do something else. Let's say up here I have a function which do something. Inside this function, I want to pass in a my array of ints, and I'll call that array. But I don't want this function to
to be able to modify this array object. I want it maybe to do some analysis or do some deep learning or something like that, right? But I don't want the array to be able to be changed. So what I do up here is I say const, right? So what that means is that this array cannot be changed inside this function. Array cannot be modified inside this function. Perfect. So let's say in here that I want to print array, right? So what I'm going to do, instead of printing it here, I'm going to call do something on my array. So what should happen is that I've allocated my array, I've set something, now I call this function on this array, right, which is const, and I just want to print it. Fine. So I run it, it says, uh-oh, uh-oh, something's wrong. This is not obvious what's wrong. And this is going to be an error that you probably run across when doing a couple of your assignments. So what this says is that passing const my array int as this argument discards qualifiers. What that means is the following. Here, I have a const my array. So I'm not able to change this array but I have called the print function. And the print function might modify the array. But this function isn't allowed to modify the array. It's very strict. It can't even call functions that can modify the array. But sometimes I have functions that I want to be able to call on const objects, like printing them. Printing them shouldn't change anything. So what I can do is I can use const at the end of the function declaration, and that says, hey compiler, this function will not modify this object. Okay? And now that I've added this qualifier, now I can call it on a const object. All right, so that's why it's important that any time you want to be able to modify something, or you, you want something to not be able to be modified, you have to qualify all of the functions that should be able to be called on a const object as const. Now let's give the last example here. Okay, Let's say that I just want to print a single value of this array. So I'm going to say standard C out array uh, 5. Right? All right, so here, all I want to do is get the value of array five and print it out. Now, here I get the same error. Why? Because if I look, the square brackets operator has not been declared as const, right? So if I then go declare this as const, what will happen? Well, that worked, but I didn't want it to be able to work because it's actually modifying the array, right? So we kind of tricked the compiler into doing that. Here's what you actually want to happen. Whenever you make a, a data structure, I don't know how it works, Strager. It's probably a warning. I'm not warning all or something like that. It shouldn't have worked. But here's what I want to be able to do. I want to be able to have one version of the square bracket operator that I can use in this fashion right here when I want to modify an index. And I want to have another const version that I want to use just to look at the array without modifying it. So I can do that. Let's create a second copy of this. Okay. And I'm going to say now that this version is const. And the reference that I return is also const. OK? Perfect. Now I can also say that the input value of index is const. So there are three places. Actually, there's kind of a fourth place where you use const here. So this means that the function is returning a const reference, which means that I cannot change the values of the returned reference. OK? So I can't look it up in memory and change it. This const means that this function will not modify the object. 
And this const means that this variable that's passed into the function can't be modified. So if I wanted to say here that index equals 12, this const would stop this from happening. So luckily, even though these two functions are named the same thing, the compiler will look up the context in which you are calling it, and it will call the right one. So let me just show you that. Standard CL const version of this, or I'll just call const this slash n. And then I'll yank that, and I'll have non-const version of that, right? So down here, I set up my array. I'm going to call the non-const version of the square bracket array. Then I'm going to pass a, my array into this function, which calls, which has the array as const. And so the compiler will call the const version of that. So what I should see, hopefully, is non-const version called first when I, when I call this, right? Then I call this, and this operator midline will be called. So I should see const version, and then I should see 77. So non-const, and then const, and then 77. Perfect. All right. So that is const correctness. So if you ever see error messages about discarding qualifiers, 99 times out of 100 in this course, it will be because you tried to do something with a const object that wasn't marked as being const. All right? So that's the second part of C++. On Tuesday, I will go into great detail about the details of the assignment, how to do the assignments, how to set up the assignment, and etc. So now you will know pretty much everything there that we need to know about C++ in order to do the assignment. And anything that you don't know yet, so we'll be going some o over some other concepts, but we'll be looking at those concepts as we discover the context for why those concepts matter. All right, so that's the end of the lecture. I'm going to answer some questions now. So why does it mean uh, what does it mean to const the return reference? Why do you need that if the argument is const? Okay, so down here, when I call this, the way that this works is because the square bracket operator returns a reference to an integer. And then I set that equal to 77. Right? But if up here... All I had was the const version of this, then what would be returned is a const reference. And you cannot set a const reference equal to anything else. And so this would be completely illegal and it would, sh it would have a, um, an error. So that's why um, you're, you have to mark this as const here because if we didn't, then this function here, this may have modified the array, right? Because it wasn't const. And as me and uh, Strager both exclaimed before, I don't know why it worked without the const, but it did. And let's just pretend that it didn't because you shouldn't do it. So absolutely everywhere, one of the signs of a great C++ programmer or even like a, a good beginner C++ programmer is um, is the fact that you adhere to RAII and const 